Hello garden friends and welcome to my channel DK's Garden Oasis. I am Debbie, Master Gardener and Butterfly Raising Hobbyist, inspiring you to bloom, grow and conserve in your garden. What's more beautiful than a monarch fluttering through your garden? In this video I will show you how to attract and raise monarchs. Make sure you stay till the end where I share a garden tip to control Japanese beetles. And boy, do I have a problem with Japanese beetles and my zinnias, so make sure you stay tuned for that. So first of all, if you hear some rumbling of some thunder or lightning in the background, we're getting a pretty good rainstorm today, much needed rain, and the garden will definitely love that. So first we need to talk about the monarch's life cycle. The life cycle of a monarch has four stages and four generations. The four stages are the egg, larva, chrysalis or pupa, and the adult butterfly. The offspring of the monarchs, there's some thunder. The offspring of the monarchs that overwintered are the first gen. That's uh, some good lightning and thunder behind us there. The offspring of the monarchs that overwintered in Mexico are the first generation that will be laid in late March, early April. And they will be laid in southern U.S. or northern Mexico. Second generation are laid in May, early June. Third generation is laid in June, July. And the fourth generation are the eggs that are laid in July through September. There are four migrations annually, two northbound and two southbound. Most butterflies in the fall are the either the third or fourth generations that are traveling south. Three generations of monarchs are reproductive and the fourth generation are non-reproductive or are in diapause until the following spring. And monarchs do not reproduce in the overwintering sites in Mexico as they travel north in northern Mexico and southern U.S. that is when they will be starting to lay eggs in late March early April. Their complete life cycle is generally about 30 days for generations one through three and almost 200 days for generation four. The egg it takes about four days to hatch the larva stage is about 14 days, the chrysalis is 10 to 14 days, and the first through third generation, generally those adult butterflies live about only two to six weeks. And the fourth generation, again, lives about six to eight months. The larva starts off by emerging from the egg and turning around and starting to eat the eggshell. And I'll sh show this short video above of what that looks like. Then the caterpillar becomes too large for its skin and then it molts and it is called, uh, when it molts, it's called an instar and they have, the monarch butterfly has five instars. And here's a picture of that above of the five instars. And in between each molt is called an instar and each caterpillar goes through five instars. The primary job of the adult butterfly is to reproduce. And here's a picture of a male and female monarch and the differences between the two. The male has two spots on the lower hind wings and on its abdomen it has two claspers. The female has thicker veins and a darker color. And this is not to be confused by the viceroy. And here's a picture of a viceroy and the differences. It has a line going through the hind wings and a lot of people are confused and think they see a monarch, but this is the difference. If you're so inclined to raise monarchs, here are some of the supplies you'll need. But the one thing I will tell you is they are a lot of work. And number one is to make sure everything is clean to prevent disease. And you may have to make sure you have enough milkweed to feed the monarchs for 14 days. I generally change out my milkweed twice a day. So that's one to two milkweed leaves per day per caterpillar. So that can add up to a lot of leaves of milkweed. 
I use a plastic container and I got these at Walmart for the first and second instar. So I use these for the egg through the second instar. So, and I'll show you what I'm going to be doing with that in a minute, but I use this for the egg to second instar. And then the second through the fifth instar, I have these mesh enclosures. And I'll leave a link to all of this in the description box below. I also have floral tubes so that they can be in water and they will stay fresher longer. So I bought this a few years ago on Amazon. I don't think they have it anymore, but this is a floral tube holder for florists, but I use it for the caterpillars. And then I buy the floral tubes and then fill it with water. I check each of either the plastic boxes or each of these floral tubes twice a day. I clean up the frass, which is caterpillar poop, and they do poop quite a bit. So you need to make sure you clean that up. And I use, there is small vacuums, but I'm always afraid I'm gonna suck up one of the caterpillars, but I do have one. And I do use that when they're all in chrysalises and I make sure there's no more caterpillars and I make sure that I use that small vacuum. But in the meantime, I just have this broken little uh, dustpan and a paintbrush and then I just scoop up the frass and put it in a plastic bag and throw that away. I also have a pair of scissors that I just use for the milkweed and it gets really sticky so you need to clean these off in between. Make sure you don't touch your eyes because I have seen people get very severe reactions if they touch their eyes so make sure you wash your hands in between. I have toothpicks and what I use the toothpicks for is sometimes they eat the leaf and fall off so I help it along by picking it up with a toothpick and putting it on a leaf or sometimes they're on the zipper which I don't want to have them do when they're starting to go in their chrysalis so I move them off with the toothpick. I also have a magnifier because I want to make sure that I uh, because I want to see when they are emerging or if I'm looking for a caterpillar on a leaf and they're pretty small so I have this magnifier. I also have this wireless digital microscope and I'll show you how I use this. I love this because I can take a picture or a video of a caterpillar or an egg of a caterpillar emerging from an egg or sometimes I take pictures of just the egg so I'll show you that soon as well and then I just have paper towels which I'll show you what I use these for in a minute sometimes the caterpillar will be on the top of this plastic lid and I leave it because they when they're molting they shouldn't be disturbed so the only time I move them is when they fall off and they're just crawling around but if they are still I leave them be and and they will find eventually a leaf also I have a larger enclosure that has a little bit firmer uh, poles on the outside so the enclosure doesn't blow away and I do put the caterpillars outside about the third or fourth instar right before they're going in their chrysalis so they can experience weather, wind, sunlight, and that helps with their directional capabilities. I also clean the enclosures after they have all emerged and I release all the butterflies. What I do is I clean them with soap and bleach and uh, water and then I let them dry outside. The verdict is still out about whether you should raise monarchs or not and I know in the West it is illegal to do that because the numbers were so low that they cannot raise caterpillars anymore in the West. And you would think that would be counterproductive because you're just trying to increase the numbers. But what I've been reading is that the reason that you don't want to raise hundreds is first of all do you have the milkweed to supply these butterflies and you don't want to raise them in large number because they'll be prone to disease 
and also can make the species weaker. I am going to raise probably a couple more years. To next year I will raise half the amount I do this year and then next year I'll raise half of that. If they do go and are on the endangered list next year and you can't raise them anymore then I will follow that. But I, in the meantime when I'm going to be doing is making sure my garden has enough host plants and nectar plants. Normally only 10% of the monarchs survive due to climate change, habitat loss, or predation. This is a little bit scientific but what I've read is that with the warmer temperatures the carbon dioxide will be too toxic for the monarchs to eat and warmer temperatures are driving the monarchs northbound and that just means they have to travel longer and this makes the migration routes even more difficult. Right now I'm raising about 25 in the summer and 20 to 25 for the fall generation. We'll see how I'll do with the fall generation. I know last year was not good. I think I only had eight last year, which part of that reason was my neighbors spray for mosquitoes. I raise about 20 to 25 for, of the fourth generation and I do tag. I have done this, I believe this is my fourth year. The first year I did find out one of mine did make it to Mexico and I'm not sure of the circumstances of how they found the tag but I did have one found and I'll link that description of the Chicago Tribune and the article the really good article they did on that. Again there is talk about the monarch going on the extinct or endangered list and that will mean you will no longer be able to raise monarchs indoors. And what I'm doing is making sure that I have plenty of host plants which is milkweed and I'll leave the slide above of the milkweed varieties that I have in my area and you can google native milkweed in your area to plant. And I also make sure I have enough nectar plants as well which I will also link above. Also I can't control what my neighbors spray as far as pesticides but I do can control my own yard and I do not spray. I have good bugs that take care of bugs like mosquitoes. So what can we do to make sure this species is not extinct? Number one you can plant milkweed that is native to your area for monarchs to lay eggs on and for monarch caterpillars to eat even if it's just a pot or two. Number two, provide native nectar rich plants for monarch butterflies to feed on. Number three, become a citizen scientist. You can track monarch migration, milkweed growth, caterpillars, etc. Number four, understand why our climate is getting warmer and what the solutions are. And finally, number five, encourage others to learn and get involved. I still hope that one day I can acquire some more land and build a butterfly habitat garden that is a legacy I would like to leave behind for people to enjoy. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of caterpillars and their stages and what I do to prepare to raise them. So now I'm going to show you how I raise them. So again this is what I start with and it's the egg and so what I do is I take this and I take a piece of paper towel. I put it in. I dampen it slightly, not too wet because you don't want it sopping wet. I put in two pieces because I check these in the morning and at night. So this should be wet enough that I don't need to spray it anymore. Maybe just a little bit. And then what I do, this is one where I have a egg. And so what I do, I'm gonna put this back in the original, but I just put it inside. And I usually have two leaves. So I put a piece down below and then the egg is on top. Now I'm not sure, let me see what I can do here. This is my magnifier and the egg is right here. I'm not sure if you could see it. So I'm going to try to get my microscope out and show you as well. 
um, and then I'll show you with the small caterpillar as well. So the egg is right on the edge there and again I'm not sure if you could see it yet. So what you do is this is called Maxi App and I will get the app up for you. And what you got to do is you got to make sure that you have wireless on and it'll say Maxi and I'll show you that. Oops. So this is the microscope. And I'm just going to turn it on. Here's the on button and it turns on. Um, it has a little cover that I put somewhere, hopefully safe. Yes, I do have it. There's a cover on here. To, um, so it's, this lights up so you can see better. And then you just put it near the egg. And you can see that it says, I don't know if you can see that on my phone, it, it says Max C. So you press that and then it will start showing on the app. So let's go to the app and this is the app. So what we need to do is, I think you can see that. I'm going to try to focus this really quick. Sometimes it's a little difficult to get the right position. You think you're, there it is. Hope you can see that. I'm going to focus it a little better. There we go. And there is the egg. So now I'm going to show you with a caterpillar. And this is like Put, I'm going to put him back in his original container and I put the date that I found him as an egg. So it should be about four days. I found him yesterday, so four days from now, the 29th. Okay, now I'm going to find this one has a caterpillar in it and I would say it's a stage two probably because stage one is right when they emerge and the second day they go to stage two. I'm not sure if you could see that but you will be able to see it on the app. So I'm going to put this down now. And let's focus in on him or her. Oh, there it is. And focus it. And those little black spots are its frasts, caterpillar poop. And there's the caterpillar. Can't see it by the naked eye uh, too much. I mean, it's pretty small. And then I showed you with the magnifying. So there he goes. He's moving a little bit. He might be eating. Give you a minute to see that. And then I'm going to show you a couple other different stages in stars. So I'm going to put him away. This one right here that you're seeing is a fifth in star. He's starting to wander around. I'm going to put him back in because he's on the move and he will go on a chrysalis pretty soon. This one I would say is a stage maybe three or four. I'm trying to get it to focus here. Three or four. These are two different sizes here. Um, I'm going to say these are in star threes here. Hopefully that's going to focus. And this one is, I would say, at stage three. And you see how the banding is a little bit different? They're all a little bit different. So I'm going to put these guys away. That is how I raise the monarchs. And um, in late summer, I will be showing you how I 
tag. I wanted to show you before I close, uh, there are a couple chrysalis in one of the enclosures and I'll show you that real quick right now. Okay, here are two of my chrysalis that went into the chrysalis a couple days ago. So you can see the skin of the one in the back is still attached and that's okay. When it emerges, it will fall off. The one that's closest to us fell off right away. So I have two right now and I'm sure there's probably a couple more that are gonna be going in a chrysalis today and tomorrow. So I will, if it's before I do this video, I will show you the one going to chrysalis. If not, I will look from last year and I'll show you what that process looks like. So I hope this video was informative and you learned something new about monarchs. So hit that like and share this video below and spread the word. In the next couple of videos, I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing it next week or if I'm going to another garden center. It really depends on weather. But I did find a bunch of black swallowtail eggs and a couple of small caterpillars. So I will be doing a black swallowtail video as well about how to attract and raise black swallowtails. So make sure you hit that subscribe and notification bell for those future videos. And if it is good weather, I may be traveling to Michigan to go to a Proven Winners Perennial Garden and also go to the Michigan Botanical Garden. Now I want to share that garden tip about controlling Japanese beetles. So that is one way that you can control Japanese beetles without using pesticides. Of course, sometimes you need to spray and what they're saying, if you do need to spray, make sure you do it in the early morning or late at night when the bees are not around because it will kill the bees. And I was at my cut flower garden this week and I looked at my zinnias and they're completely destroyed by the Japanese beetles. So I'm planning on using this method before I have to use a pesticide. And I'll try to show you a short video about what those Japanese beetles do to the flowers and the leaves. And did you know that these Japanese beetles lay their eggs in your gr grass and emerge as grubs and turn into lawn grubs in July and August. Grubs eat and dig around the roots of the grass in late summer. And then they hibernate all winter and then re-emerge in the spring ready to destroy your grass. Some more environmentally friendly options would be to grow resistant or repellent plants like common rue, arborvitae, garlic, catnip, and geraniums. And what I didn't know about geraniums and the Japanese beetle is within 30 minutes of the Japanese beetle eating the flower, it is paralyzed and will die. So I am going to plant some. Geraniums are not my favorite, but I am planning on uh, planting some geraniums around my garden next year. So if you have any other environmentally friendly tips, leave it in the comments below. Thanks for watching and happy gardening. Bye-bye.